All right, moving on to chapter three. No, I didn't forget chapter two. Chapter two deals with data and how to collect data, um, which is an important topic. But in an intro to statistics class, sometimes you have to kind of pick and choose what you're going to be able to talk about. And frankly, we just don't have enough time to talk about the second of our four steps in the four step process of statistics. So we essentially just skip over it. So we kind of just assume that, all right, data can be collected in a lot of these problems. We'll just have a question that we're interested in studying and we'll start out with the data. And the first step will be to analyze that data, which you learned in 1.6. But yeah, there is a lot to collecting data properly, um, making sure that your samples representative of your population, those kind of ideas. And if you're interested in that, you can read more about it in chapter two. However, for the purposes of our class, we're gonna skip that. And in chapter three, we're gonna start talking about what's called the normal distribution. And I've mentioned that before briefly when we were talking about the shapes of distributions, uh, specifically this uh, symmetric bell-shaped distribution. Maybe I made a comment about how it's really prevalent in nature and in a lot of natural sciences. Things tend to have this shape. If you collected sample from a lot of different things and made histograms, you'd see that this kind of roughly speaking shape would show up more than maybe you'd expect it to. It shows up very common, and that's because a lot of things in nature and in natural sciences can be estimated using this distribution called the normal distribution. And a normal distribution is symmetric bell shape. So what we're going to do in 3.1, or maybe even chapter 3, is we're going to talk about the normal distribution. This is just one specific distribution that happens to be symmetric bell shape. There's other symmetric bell shape distributions, but this one ends up being the most important. In fact, the remainder of this class, almost everything will be talking about this distribution. And that might seem surprising because just a minute ago when we were talking about shapes, we talked about things being left skewed and right skewed. What will turn out is even if you're studying something that's right skewed, for example, there is a way to learn about that, loosely speaking, using the normal distribution. And I can't get too far into it yet because we haven't learned enough topics yet. But what you'll see is even something whose shape is not normal can be approximated with something normal. There's some special property of a normal distribution that allows it to work for any shape, loosely speaking. At any rate, chapter three, we're talking about the normal distribution. In 3.1, there's a ton of information. So what I did is I split it up into two different parts. First, we're gonna talk about the empirical rule. This is one of the, um, I don't know, mathier things that we'll talk about in this class. This is something that, it, it tends to be the first topic that a subset of students struggle with a little bit. Uh, we'll go through it slowly. I'll give you extra practice if you need more practice. And I'll show you a couple of different methods. Hopefully we can find something that works for everybody with the empirical rule. And then we'll talk more about 3.1, but we'll be using our calculator. We're gonna be using different functions on our calculator, which you haven't learned yet, but I'm gonna teach them to you. I'm gonna show you what menu they're in. I'm gonna show you how to use them. Um, and then you'll be able to answer questions either using the empirical rule or calculator functions. What questions are you answering? That's what I want to get into in this video. So in this video, I'm not actually going to show you empirical rule or calculator function. I'm just going to talk generally speaking about the types of questions that we will see and how you'll be able to use these things to answer the questions. So let me start out with the picture. So here's our picture. You're going to be drawing a lot of this picture. You can draw a lot of distributions that have this shape. It's roughly symmetric, make it as symmetric as you can, and roughly bell-shaped. We're gonna start out with something that's normal, or at least approximately normal, as well as you can draw it. Uh, and what I will tell you is maybe assume, and then I'll come up with whatever example I want. So assume the height of redwood trees. I think that's something that I've talked about already. And I should probably put in some stipulations in some specific forest, if the trees are fully grown, blah, blah, blah. Assume the height of redwood trees are normally distributed. And I'll tell you the mean. With the mean, maybe I should Google this. I don't know how tall a redwood tree is. All right, let's see, per Google, uh, redwood, some of the tallest trees can reach more than 350 height. Wow, there's one that's 380 feet tall. That's crazy, who knew? Um, let's say that the average height of a fully grown redwood tree um, is, I don't know, nice round number, maybe 250 feet. Assume the height of redwood trees are normally distributed with a mean of 250 feet and a standard deviation 
of, I don't know, um, 30 feet. Sure. Say you were given this information right here. First off, there's three things you're looking for in these problems. First, it tells you that something is normally distributed. You'll see that in every single problem. You'll be told to assume that something is normally distributed. At this point, we have to be told that. Later, we're going to get around that. That's what told me to draw this shape right here, that it was normally distributed. Then it's going to tell me the mean and the standard deviation. Note, that makes sense. When something is left or right skewed, I'm worried about outliers. And when I'm worried about outliers, I want to use median and interquartile range. But if the shape is symmetric, that's why I'm using mean and standard deviation. So it kind of makes sense that in every single one of these problems in chapter 3.1, you're going to be told the mean and the standard deviation. A minor thing here, um, you're kind of being told to assume the height is 250 feet. You're not going out and randomly selecting 20 trees and measuring each one and calculating the mean. You're being told that the mean of all of these trees is 250 feet. You're being told that mu, the population mean, is 250, and sigma, the population standard deviation, is 30. Instead of x bar, the sample average, and s, the sample standard deviation, you're, what you're really given, if you read this problem carefully, or if you learn to pull out the right information, is some parameters, not statistics. You'll be given you the population average and the population standard deviation. In every one of these problems, it'll say it's normally distributed, it'll tell you the mean, it'll tell you the standard deviation. What do you do with that information? You draw a picture. And this picture I'm about to draw for you is going to be a picture we're going to be drawing all the way until the last week of this class. You're drawing lots of these pictures. You'll be drawing this shape right here, and then you always take the mean and put it right in the middle. So maybe there's 250 right there. And then what you can do is the normal distribution has this property that it's spread out according to its standard deviation. And what I mean by that is if I count up and down by whatever the standard deviation is, 30 in this case, from the mean, I can space things out so that when I'm three standard deviations above or below the mean, I'm pretty close to the end of this distribution here. That's a bit of a misnomer, but I'll get into that in a minute. What I mean is maybe there's one, two, three. Notice by the time I'm three of these above the mean, I'm getting pretty close to the end here. And then three below, one, two, three, same story. By the time I'm three below, I'm pretty close out to the end. These are supposed to be separated by 30s. That's what my scale is here. So this would be 280, this would be 310, and this would be 340. This would be 220 if I subtract 30 from 250, and then 190 if I subtract 30 again, and then 160. So you have this distribution and you have these numbers down on the bottom and every one of these problems you'll be setting your problem up this way. And what I want to teach you in this video is what the area underneath the curve represents. The way you're supposed to think about it is in terms of percentages. So if somebody drew a picture for you and let's just say they shaded in, I don't know, from 250 to 280. Let's say somebody shaded in this right here. I want you to understand what that shaded region represents. Later, when we get into the empirical rule and the calculator functions, we'll learn how to calculate the area of this shaded region. What you'll see is this area is about 34%. Of the total amount of area underneath this curve, about 34% of it lies between 250 and 280. Where'd that 34% come from? You haven't learned that yet. You'll learn that once we stop, start talking about the empirical rule over here. So just take this as a given. Pretend that I'm drawing you this picture and I'm shading in from here to here, and I'm labeling it as 34%. What I want you to understand from this video is what that means. And there's two different interpretations. I'll give you those two interpretations, um, talk a little bit more about my picture, and then we'll be done. So two interpretations. The first interpretation is this is telling you that 34% of all redwood trees Thirty-four percent because that was labeled in the picture again. We don't know how to come up with that 34% yet You have to assume that's given to you 34% of all redwood trees are between 250 and 280 feet tall or whoop, 
or at least all redwood trees that I'm talking about over here, fully grown in some forest, blah, blah, blah. 34% of all, the first interpretation of this picture is the percent that shaded is the percentage of the entire population that falls within those bounds. That's the first interpretation of this picture. It doesn't have to be redwood trees. It doesn't have to be these numbers. We're talking about anything. If you are given a picture and some area is shaded in, and in this case I'm shading from 250 to 280, then that tells you the percentage of all whatever we're talking about that is between that number and that number. The second interpretation is in terms of probabilities. It's the probability Try that again. That one randomly selected redwood tree is between whatever bounds, 250 and 280 feet in this case. Being comfortable with these two interpre interpretations will be more important than you think. Right now, it won't be too bad because you'll kind of see in every single problem, it sort of asks you, what percentage of all redwood trees are between 250 and 280 feet, for example? And you're like, oh, you just want me to figure out how much area there is underneath this curve between 250 and 280? Sure, I'll learn how to do that in the next video with the empirical rule. I'll learn that that's 34%. Or the question will say, what is the probability that if you randomly select some tree, that tree is between 250 and 280 feet? And you're like, yeah, I'm just trying to find this area, and I'm going to learn how to do that with the empirical rule or with the calculator functions in future videos. It's kind of always the same thing, so you don't get too hung up on these questions here. But what you'll see is in future sections, we can ask more questions and different questions, and being comfortable with what the picture represents will be more and more important. And so what happens in a lot of instances in this class is things start out a little bit easy and people take it for granted, and then when we see it in a harder context later on, if they don't spend enough time the first time around, it can really give them a hard time. So I really want to stress that there's two different interpretations of this picture that you'll be drawing, and they're these two interpretations. In the next video, I'll show you what questions will look like, what you should expect to see on your quiz, how you can come up with this 34%. But for now, I just want to talk about the interpretations of the picture. Two more kind of theoretical things that I want to talk about quickly. The first one is I told you to space these out, these standard deviations, so that by the time you're three standard deviations above or below the mean, you're close to the end of this distribution. It's a bit of a lie. This distribution never ends. It goes on forever and ever. A property of the normal distribution is technically this goes on forever and ever in both directions. However, the height gets so low, so close to the axis here, that there's virtually no area out here when you get past three de standard deviations out. So people stop drawing it. They draw it as though it ends, although technically it never ever ends. It just gets really, really, really close to the axis. So there's hardly any area out there really far in the tail, so you don't worry about it. The other comment that I wanted to make is I said how three standard deviations should be close to the edges of this distribution. One standard deviation above and below the mean should fall at what's called an inflection point. And if you've taken a calculus class, that might have meaning to you. But even if you haven't, that's okay. All it means is if you think about this as like a hill, this hill is not very steep up top here, right? If you're standing right here, you're not about to fall this way. But as you walk further and further this way, it gets steeper and steeper and steeper eventually you get down here where it's not steep again. Right, it's not too steep up here, it's not too steep down here, but in between here it's really, really steep. There's one point on the hill where it's as steep as it ever gets. If you take a time, go a little bit higher up the hill, it's less steep, a little bit lower down the hill, it's less steep. That point is what's called the inflection point, and with the normal distribution, one standard deviation above and below the mean should fall at the inflection point of this curve. I'm never gonna test you on that, and I'm never going to mark off points like, ooh, your picture doesn't look quite perfect. It looks like your inflection point is a little bit more than one standard deviation below or above the mean. But those are just characteristics of a normal distribution that I figured I should probably talk about. They're little minor things that I guess don't hurt to know. But the important things to know is that you're going to be drawing this picture over and over again and that you are going to be shading in regions. And I want you to understand what that shaded region represents. There's two different things. They're listed right here and right here. And if those are making sense to you at this point, I think the next video will go a lot better.